the short story is that NVIDIA has been around for about 25 years now. Um, for maybe about half that time until the early 2000s, NVIDIA was primarily a graphics company. Um, and then in the early 2000s, there were um, some really smart guys over at Stanford, uh, one of whom, uh, Ian Buck, is now the head of our Tesla business unit. Uh, and Ian uh, went ahead and developed a computer language that could turn this uh, graphics device into something that could do uh, high performance computation. Uh, and that language is called CUDA. And um, since then, we've not only um, built hardware uh, that will specifically um, uh, that is specifically optimized for compute, but we've invested billions of dollars in R&D into the software stack uh, that's really turned a graphics device uh, into um, a device for uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and of course, NVIDIA is still involved heavily in graphics. We make a lot of our revenue from gaming, uh, professional visualization, uh, but increasingly uh, our revenue and market valuation is coming from our, our investments in AI. Uh, so here's a good graphical uh, depiction of what's been going on here. Um, so in the early 2000s is right around when we uh, invested in CUDA, uh, our general purpose language for GPUs. Uh, so if we look at Moore's law over time, um, uh, you, you know, you, you, you're seeing, uh, you know, Moore's law is applying probably through like the late 2000s, right? Like very coincidentally around when we started investing in CUDA. Now, obviously we didn't invest in CUDA to kill Moore's law. It just happened that we were turning uh, the GPU into a general processor around the same time that the CPU, um, that, that single thread of performance was starting to tail off. Uh, and fortunately, the GPU not only has multiple threads, um, but it has approximately you know, 5,000 CUDA cores in the latest, um, in, in the latest V100 GPU. Uh, so, so the GPU is really a compute beast. Um, and it's not just something for graphics, it's not just something for deep learning, it's, um, it's a device that can do any sort of parallel computation. Uh, so, so the challenge is increasingly in, in, in the software side and being able to take an application that was written uh, to run on uh, you know, a single thread or on a, a limited number of threads and um, parallelize that across um, you know, many, many computing cores. Uh, so you'll see that you know, we're, we're both investing on the, on, on the hardware side, uh, but also um, you know, on, on our entire software stack. Uh, so, so what does CUDA look like? Well, you, you have your application code, and most of it's going to run on the CPU, right? We're, we're not building GPUs to, uh, to do your email. Uh, we're, we're not you know, building GPUs to run Microsoft Office. Uh, it's really for the compute-intensive part of your, of your code, right? Uh, so you, we, we still need CPUs. Uh, all of our GPU systems are going to have CPUs on them. Uh, but what we're going to do is... Um, we're going, to, we're going to optimize the process by which you take the compute intensive code, move it over to the GPU, do the compute on the GPU, and then move it back to the CPU. Uh, and in CUDA, this is basically a graphical depiction of CUDA in 20 seconds, right? So we start with our data that's going to be in some sort of, um, some sort of storage, uh, and we'll, we'll have this in the CPU memory, and then we're going to load it across PCI, um, unless you're on a power system. Uh, which it's MB linked, and then we bring it into the uh, into the GPU memory, and we're going to cache it on the GPU, uh, do some compute, and then move it back to the CPU. So it, it's really as simple as that. The rest of it's just CUDA. Okay, so what does NVIDIA offer in terms of products? Uh, well, we, we divide it up on this is, and, and again, we, we offer products that are broader than this. You know, we obviously have a large uh, consumer business, uh, but on the uh, on the artificial intelligence side. Uh, we're divided up into both training and inference. Uh, so, so if you see on the left here, uh, we have both our, uh, our own systems, right? So we have these uh, DGX Station, uh, DGX1, and, uh, and now DGX2. So these are four, eight, and 16 GPU systems. Um, I don't want to talk too much about our own systems because this is a partnership with WeWin, and they have some really great GPU systems I'm going to talk about uh, on the next slide here. Um, so we'll keep it focused on the GPU that goes inside, and we're gonna we're going to go into a little bit more detail about what the what the V100 looks like. Uh, so again, we have these consumer cards. We have Titan Vs. Uh, you can plug them in uh, to you know, your workstation, and you can start doing deep learning uh, at a relatively low cost. But if you want to scale out in a data center, uh, you you really want these Tesla V100s. 
Uh, and there, there's a bunch of different features that go into our data center cards that we don't have in our consumer cards. You know, obviously the you know the consumer cards are going to be uh, actively cooled. Uh, you know, the, the Tesla V100 is going to be passively cooled, uh, and uh, the Tesla V100 also comes in this SXM2 form factor uh, with the NVLink interconnect. So if you're if you're scaling up to uh, multiple V100s, uh, a lot of times the bottleneck is going to be not in the um, in the compute, but in the in the I/O or the you know the bandwidth between the GPUs. Uh, so so we do a lot of optimizations there, uh, and there's uh, you know a whole stack of data center management tools that go along with uh, our data center cards. And you're also going to get full uh, full support from Nvidia uh, if you're buying our our systems or from our OEM partners like like we would uh, if you're uh, if you're if you're buying our cards in in their uh, qualified servers, uh, on the uh, data center side, we also have uh, special cards that are dedicated for inference. So we have our uh, our P4, and we recently announced uh, our um, our inference card based on our touring architecture. Uh, so the, it's called the Tesla T4 that will be available um, uh, fairly soon down the line. Uh, and the, the main difference between the P4 and the V100 is that the P4 is going to be a lower power device. So the V100, uh, you're going to clock at 250 watts or 300 watts, depending on your uh, PCIe or SXM2 uh, with NVLink. And the P4 is going to come at 50 or 75 watts. So uh, it's power efficient, but it's not really meant for training. You're only getting 8 gigs of GPU memory, uh, and uh, you don't have the NVLink interconnect. So if you're training really large models, uh, large data sets, uh, you know, you, you, it's, you know, it's going to be much more uh, cost effective to, to do it on the V100. Uh, but if you want to, um, if you want to do uh, inference, uh, the P4 is a good card for that. And we also have various embedded systems, and uh, we're going to keep it focused on the data center. But just wanted to throw out there that uh, we also recently announced our next generation for uh, Jetson and Drive PX called Xavier, uh, and uh, yeah, happy to talk about that with any uh, automotive people that might be in the audience. Great. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, our uh, partnership that we have with WeWin here. So um, I believe we've already gone into more detail about what each of these systems do. Um, just wanted to point them out real quick. Uh, these are all going to be based on our uh, V100, the, the ones that were mentioned already. Uh, so we have the 21-inch, 19-inch, and then this uh, giant uh, 16 V100 system here, the, the XC200. Uh, I also want to throw in the, uh, the SV300G3, uh, which is uh, a system for inference. And uh, this, uh, I've heard from WeWin that they're also going to be uh, releasing this of our next generation uh, inference GPUs for the T4. Uh, so, that's, so that's really exciting. Uh, let's take a closer look at the, at the V100. Uh, so the V100 is an enormous GPU, right? This is uh, 21 plus billion transistors. Um, it's divided up into 80 streaming multiprocessors, so we can think of these as uh, sort of the um, maybe not the atomic unit of the GPU or the molecular unit. It's a sort of a way of uh, breaking up the GPU, and each of these are going to have identical uh, compute cores inside. Uh, and among these CUDA cores, there's 5,120 CUDA cores on the entire GPU, and of those, we have these 640 tensor cores. And the tensor cores are basically as close to an ASIC as uh, NVIDIA will build, right? So it's almost like an ASIC on a GPU that does one thing really well. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that in a few slides. Uh, but the idea behind the tensor cores is that um, we, we want to build these compute cores that are really, really performant for uh, training neural networks and for inference as well. Uh, in terms of uh, GPU memory, we have ultra-fast uh, HPM2 memory, 900 gigabytes a second. Uh, and we also have 300 gigabytes a second NVLink interconnect between the GPUs. Uh, note that it says 16 gigs right here. Um, I, I just noticed that I, I stole this slide from, uh, from an old uh, presentation on Volta. These are now available in 32 gigs. And here's a look at one of these SMs. So we have 80 of these SMs on the GV100. Uh, so the GV100 is the GPU, the V100 is the product, right? So sometimes we'll have multiple, uh, multiple products for a single GPU. We'll use the GPU. Uh, we'll use the same GPU in our in our GeForce card that we do in our data center, um, but the but the actual uh, product itself, you know, the cooling, uh, you know, where, where the GPU actually sits on, that's going to be different between the you know between the data center and uh, uh, and the consumer card. Uh, it turns out that we actually don't really have any other uh, GV100. Uh, the V100. This is uh, this is basically unique to the V100 here. 
Um, and you can see how it's divided up into these different arithmetic units. Uh, so we get a lot of questions about, you know, okay, how does NVIDIA feel about ASICs, you know, Google's TPU, GraphCore's IPU, you know, there's, you know, uh, you know, dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of startups out there that are competing to, you know, provide, uh, you know, sort of engineer a uh, machine learning chip from scratch. Uh, and our response to that is that the GPU is really a, a general purpose compute unit, right? It's not, it's not general purpose in the sense of a CPU that it can run every single function, like you're not going to run an OS on a GPU, uh, but for compute, you can do pretty much any type of compute on the GPU. Uh, so we support both double precision arithmetic, uh, obviously single precision, um, and then uh, for, for training neural networks, we really recommend a combination of half and full precisions. We call it mixed precision, where we'll do the multiplications, and I'll, I'll show you this on the next slide here. Um, so this is what the tensor cores are for. In, in hardware, we have these tensor cores that optimize this 4 by 4 matrix multiplication. Uh, we do the multiplication half precision, and then we can, you can either add uh, half precision or full precision. And when you're going through and training the network, uh, you're, you're going to store a copy of your weights in full precision, but do all the multiplications in half precision. And theoretically, this can lead to up to a 12x speed up. Um, and uh, so this is responsible for uh, a lot of the acceleration and training neural networks uh, going from the P100 uh, to, to the V100. Okay, let's take a look at what's going on with, uh, with deep learning here. Uh, just, just trying to get a sense of time uh, here. Um, we'll get, get like a heads up with 10 minutes or so, or five minutes. Cool. So, um, so as we saw in the WeWin presentation, there's uh, we, we think of uh, the, the explosion of deep learning being at the confluence of uh, you know of, of of having the available hardware to train really large models and also having uh, the availability of big data, right? Uh, and uh, another thing I want to point out here is that NVIDIA GPUs are not just for images. You know, and that, you know, to, to me that seems obvious to someone who works with customers at NVIDIA. There's a lot of different applications that are being built with GPUs where people say, okay, well, you, know, you have graphics cards, right? Aren't they, aren't they really good for, for images? Well, it turns out that um, you know, we, we can also accelerate speech and translation here. Right? It's, you know, all an image is at the end of the day is, you know, is an array of pixels, you know, and pixels are just going to be, you know, numerical values that are going to be arranged, and, you know, uh, you know, an RGB image is no different than, you know, um, you know, some sort of uh, array of data, you know, maybe it might be sparse data, it could be, um, it could be, it could be uh, you know, speech data, it could be, uh, it could be natural language, you can, you can have all sorts of different applications that as long as, um, as long as the code that's going to analyze this can be parallelized, uh, we can accelerate on the GPUs. Uh, so so um, AlexNet was really the first neural network uh, that sparked the GPU revolution. Uh, but if, if you look at the complexity of neural networks over time, this is kind of a funky graph uh, you know, on, the, on the, the horizontal axis we're going uh, increasing one year at a time, and on the vertical axis we decide to multiply bandwidth by giga ops. Uh, but, um, you, know, you, you get the idea of how, uh, you know, how much more complex these networks are getting over time. Um, and so in order to do that, we need really, really good hardware. Uh, and this gives you an idea of not just how much faster the GPU is than the CPU, but also the scalability of GPUs. So uh, starting from the bottom here, uh, longer is uh, worse. We don't want to spend a lot of time training our neural networks. Um, so, you know, it, with uh, you know, dual core CPU, we're talking you know almost a month uh, to to train Reza. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm guessing this is on the image that data set. Uh, if we had a single node P100, uh, it would take 4.8 days. But going from P100 to V100, we go from 4.8 days to 30 hours. And so. You know, that, that's more than we would typically expect in the GPU generation, maybe not quite the 12x uh, theoretical speed up in tensor cores because there's other sorts of computation that goes on. You have to read the data uh, onto the GPU. Um, you know, not everything's going to be done in the tensor core units, um, but you know, you're still getting a pretty good speed up there uh, across generations of microarchitecture. Uh, and then when we scale up in our DGX1 system, we're getting very close to linear scaling here, right? So um, 30 hours to, to four hours. Uh, so not quite linear, but very, very good. And then we also get very good multi-node scaling. So if we go from 8x to uh, 256x V100, so multiple DGX1 systems, we can get it down to 14 minutes. Um, so you might not need to train ResNet in 14 minutes, but uh, it's good to know if you have massive amounts of data. Uh, and 
you have the resources to buy a large GPU cluster, you can get this type of scaling. Uh, so, so where, what, what, like, what's what's behind all this performance? Well, we talked about the hardware a bit, um, but we're going to optimize the entire software stack that runs on top of that hardware. Uh, so, it all starts with CUDA. Um, but the reason that we're really good with training neural networks, part of it is because neural networks are easily parallelized, but it's also because we made the software investment in something called QDNN a few years ago. Um, and the idea behind QDNN is, you know, there's lots of ways that you can represent these computations at the, you know, at the CUDA level, right? Um, but what, what QDNN does is, you know, we, we go through and we find the optimal way of doing all the convolutions and activations. And uh, you know, again, this is not just for images, so this is also RNNs, LSTMs, uh, all the sorts of uh, all the sorts of arithmetic operations that go into training a neural network uh, and uh, doing inference on a trained model. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is going to be optimized uh, on on the QDNN side. Um, on the inference side, it's often necessary to, to recompile this train network. Um, you, know, you, you might have something that's optimal for training, uh, but it's too complex of a network uh, for inference. So we have an additional software called TensorRT that's going to take your train architecture. Um, it's going to have your architecture and your train weights, and you're going to put that into the TensorRT engine, and it's going to optimize that for inference. Uh, so one of the things that we can do is you could, you could calibrate your weights. So if you train in uh, half precision, uh, with full precision add, uh, half precision multiply full precision add. Uh, t it turns out that you can actually get pretty close to the same accuracy by doing inference in 8-bit. Right? You can't train in 8-bit because it's iterative and over time your performance is going to drop off. Uh, but, um, you know, but if you're just doing a single forward pass, you can get close to the same precision, uh, or sorry, close to the same accuracy uh, with tensor RT. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other libraries here. So for multi-GPU communication, which we, we've already heard a bit about, uh, we have uh, MVLink is our hardware optimization, Nickel is our software optimization. So you can think of this as analogous to MPI, but for, uh, but for GPU communication. Uh, and then we also have some, uh, some linear algebra libraries. So these are analogous to, to BLAST and, Spark, uh, and uh, Sparse, uh, but, for, uh, the, you know, but for CUDA. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other uh, applications that we build, both on the automotive side and on the video inferencing side. And uh, DeepStream is our one for video inference. Uh, so, um, and then between our lower level optimizations and the applications that you actually build on the GPU, uh, we optimize for all the existing uh, deep learning frameworks out there. Right? So you'll notice that NVIDIA doesn't have a, um, a framework for training neural networks. What we do instead is we make sure that uh, everything runs optimally on all, the, um, on all the existing frameworks out there. Right? So we work closely with Google on TensorFlow and you know, with Facebook on uh, PyTorch and Cafe2. Um, we have um, you know, dozens of, uh, of engineers at NVIDIA whose job is specifically to, um, you know, to, to make sure that these frameworks are running optimally. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about what TensorRT is, uh, because I think uh, most people here are, are already sold on the idea that GPUs are really good for training. Uh, the inference is, uh, is still something that we have to sell a lot of people on. You know, people can understand, okay, you got large amounts of data, uh, you know, you can you can train in you know batch size of you know however many thousand across you know however many thousand GPUs or you know 128 DGX ones. Uh, you know, at really large scale, you know, parallel computation makes sense. Uh, it's sometimes a little bit harder to sell people on the idea that you know if you're just doing a single forward pass of a, you know batch size of one, that a GPU you can actually take advantage of the parallel architecture of the GPU to get much better performance than you could on just the CPU. Uh, and that's because all the operations that go into a neural network, regardless of whether you're batching or how, how large your data set is, uh, you, know, you can do a lot of these operations in parallel for, you know, for, you know, for just, a, just a, single uh, a single observation. Uh, and so in order to turn this uh, throughput beast of the GPU into something that can operate at low latency, uh, we, we built something called NVIDIA TensorRT. And you know, like I said, what TensorRT is going to do is going to take your network that's optimized for training and then recompile it for inference. Uh, and uh, this is something that you can run on multiple platforms. And this is another advantage of the GPU, right, is that you can, you know, you can train uh, in the data center, you, know, you can deploy in automotive, you can deploy in an embedded system. You, know, you can you know, have this model that's been trained uh, you know, in the cloud or in an on-prem server, and you can move this model over to some edge device and you, know, you, can, you can do your inference there, you can collect data there, you can move that back to the data center, 
Uh, this is you know basically one unified platform across um, across a bunch of different um, deployment and uh, a bunch of different places in which you can both train and deploy models. Uh, and one of the things that we announced earlier this year is integrating TensorRT with TensorFlow. I think we actually probably announced this about a year and a half ago now, but uh, there was a lot of engineering effort that had to go into this integration. Uh, and now what you can actually get is TensorRT like, natively in TensorFlow, right? So you can, like from the TensorFlow API, uh, you, can, you can actually run TensorRT. Uh, you know, if you, if you build TensorFlow with TensorRT support, or if even easier, you just pull the container. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about containers in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, one thing that we do to make things easier for developers, because data scientists don't want to spend, you know, like, they, they want to spend their time actually training models. They don't want to spend time building software. Um, and so, what we did to make sure that uh, it's, it's easiest for data scientists or any end users of, of our software is that we've already done all the optimizations ourselves, we've built the software, and then we, we, we build these containers that start, you know, from, from the, the level of the Jeep, sorry, um, from the level of the GPU and the driver uh, all the way up to the framework level. And we've done the optimizations at every single level here. And then what we do is we put these containers into uh, a container repository called the NVIDIA GPU Cloud, which is a total misnomer because uh, it's not just for cloud, it's also for on-prem. And you don't actually get any GPUs in there, right? So what you get instead is this repository of optimized containers, uh, both on the deep learning side, but also on the ProViz side, on the HPC application side. And it's really as simple, you could probably do it between now and, between now, I, I would challenge someone in the audience, right? Between now and when I'm done the talk, you could register for NVIDIA GPU Cloud, pull a container, uh, and train MNIST to 98% accuracy if you know which container to go to. It's PyTorch 1710. Uh, so, and these are things that we update every single month, right? So we, we make sure that, you know, all the, the patches and bug fixes, you know, our engineers are gonna take care of that so that you don't have to. Uh, and another thing that we announced recently is, uh, is support for Kubernetes on GPUs. Uh, so in, in, uh, let, let's say you have a deployment environment with a bunch of different GPUs and you need some sort of, um, you need some sort of way of managing resources you know, amongst a bunch of different users. Uh, you know, maybe you have a heterogeneous environment of different types of GPUs. Uh, Kubernetes is a great solution for that. Uh, I'm not gonna talk in detail about that, but um, just wanted to throw it out there that uh, we, we now have GPU support for Kubernetes. Great. Uh, how am I on time here? Are we, uh, we, we good? I'm done.